I just want to welcome everyone for joining us today in celebration of the Naval Cemetery Landscape's fifth anniversary. Um, so this is the fifth open season to the public and we're really excited about where NCL is headed um, into the future, the season and beyond. Um, so we thought we would take this opportunity to share with you um, some of the history about the site, the, a, a nice little nostalgic recap of our first five years being open to the public and um, give some of the people that have been with us um, and involved in the NCL since the very beginning an opportunity to share some of their favorite moments and favorite aspects uh, about the NCL. Um, as I go through the presentation, um, I'm going to be using the term NCL frequently, just because it's much shorter than saying Naval Cemetery Landscape, um, but just to make sure everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say that. So um, I'd love to- I'm not table salt. You're not talking about table salt. No, not talking about table salt. Talking about Naval Cemetery Landscape, Memorial Meadow and Sacred Grove, Project of Brooklyn Greenway Initiative. Um, I'd love to go through and talk, um, introduce our panelists. Uh, we have three amazing visionaries with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce the um, three of them and every, each of them will have an opportunity to talk a little bit about their involvement um, with the NCL as a project um, before we get started on the presentation. So Jeffrey, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Hello and uh, happy anniversary Naval Cemetery Landscape. Um, my name is Jeffrey Long Henry. I'm a landscape architect at Nelson Bird Waltz Landscape Architects. Um, and, uh, privileged to have been involved in this project since I think 2011 when BGI uh, and, and at that point a project led by um, Milton Purrier initiated a small design a competition for ideas for this site that was uh, behind a fence and had been forgotten for many years and was destined to be the first green space or the, the first node along the Brooklyn Greenway. And we were invited uh, by what, who was then Rogers Marvel Architects to join their team. We developed a concept uh, with them and were selected by Brooklyn Greenway to work together to develop uh, the concept through design and through construction. And here we are uh, nine years later uh, with the, the beautiful site fully operational. Um, it's, uh, you know, Nelson Bird Waltz, we work on a wide range of projects from campuses to planning uh, gardens and uh, botanic gardens, but you know this is a project that's really close to my heart, close to my home, um, and I'm excited to be here to talk about it with you all. Thank you, and Jeffrey is also a newly minted uh, member of the Naval Cemetery Landscape Advisory Committee, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about going uh, towards the end of the presentation, but an exciting um, notch in your belt, I think. <laughs> um, Doug, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for organizing this, Danielle. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Doug Chapman, and I'm a tour guide with Turnstile Tours. And uh, we've been giving tours of the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for many, many years. I myself for 10. And uh, my background is in a few different things, one of which is sustainability and design and ecology, as well as theater. And so I bring those perspectives to this particular project. And one of the tours that I developed for turnstile tours at the Brooklyn Navy Yard specifically focuses on urban ecology and the way ecological stories emerge and can be appreciated in the context of this uh, industrial park, uh, which is the Brooklyn Navy Yard Industrial Park. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on if you're not familiar. But uh, so it's the urban ecology focus that I bring here. And uh, what we do at Turnstile is we build partnerships with community organizations and nonprofit groups that we feel are doing really valuable work and help those organizations build capacity to share their story with the public. And so on the urban ecology tours, we've worked quite closely with the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative um, as a partner to, uh, to sort of build out that story and share the story of what they're doing at the Naval Cemetery Landscape, which was the where we wind up these ecology tours. It's sort of the, the, the jewel of the tour itself. Um, so I'm happy to bring that, that perspective uh, to the conversation today. Thanks for being here, Doug. Scott? Hi, afternoon. Um, beautiful afternoon to be opening the, the uh, or talking about the, the Naval Cemetery today and uh, um, learning about how it's evolved in the past five years or so. 
Um, my name is Scott Demmel. I'm an architect with Marvel Architects. Uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, his office and our office were partnered together for the development of the design of this, of this space, which had been a, a long forgotten or long inaccessible area uh, within the Navy Yard and within Brooklyn. Um, our, our office uh, in combination with, with Jeffrey's office came, came together with the vision uh, um, and, and also working with, with the Navy Yard as well with um, some of the history that was there and working with the Brooklyn Greenway initiative with how they wanted to envision uh, actually operating this site and developing a very unique public space um, along the route of the Greenway within Brooklyn. Um, it's actually the first public space that the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative is actually operating uh, on, on their behalf. Um, my involvement has been throughout the design and throughout the, the construction process uh, for, for the project. Um, and then, of course, we've also been doing some other work with, with the Greenway as well, with thinking about other places that, that might uh, evolve similarly to the, uh, the Naval Cemetery landscape at other locations in Brooklyn. Uh, and doing some visioning with that. Um, and so kind of over time, I've become a little bit more involved with the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative and, and understanding what they're about and what some of their, what some of their mission is. And so I've, I've actually joined with the board uh, with the Greenway Initiative as well. Uh, I've been serving that capacity for, I think, about four years now. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I am also going to introduce myself quickly. My name is Danielle Not. Um, I'll be moderating the panel this afternoon. My involvement actually came uh, from being in, in the NCL uh, as a beekeeper um, before, right before the NCL opened to the public in 2016. I needed to emergency evacuate my beehives from a friend's backyard and they found a home at the NCL, thanks to Milton, who let me in through a back gate. Um, and I have been sort of experiencing the NCL from that perspective uh, since 2016. And um, it's really become a second home to me as, uh, as a connection to nature in such an urban setting. And it let, this connection led me to join BGI as a staff member in January of 2019 um, as an associate at the NCL. And um, today I'm the coordinator of the landscape, working with the other associates to steward the land um, and learn from it and, and help uh, visitors interpret it. So I'm always excited to learn more about the NCL and I'm excited to um, have the three of you here with me to sort of share some of your favorite um, parts about the NCL throughout its first five years open to the public. For those of you that are joining us that haven't been to the NCL before, uh, we're going to, and for those of you who have, um, the presentation today is going to walk you through a little bit of context. So all of the information you need to sort of understand what took the uh, NCL from an idea into reality, all of the history that was interpreted and influencing the design, um, and all of the um, sort of uh, background sort of information that one would want to have um, in experiencing the space. Um, so this kind of starts us off um, on the, the, the historical journey of the NCL. Um, here is a map from the mid 1800s, but it depicts what is Wallabout Bay uh, in the 1770s. And just a side note, um, I, even though this presentation or this historical portion of the presentation starts in 1770, um, <laughs> this is not when history started. Um, and so Wallabout Bay as you know, a really historically rich geographical location um, is interpreted into the NCL's design as well. Um, in addition to the Na Native Americans who um, were cultivating and living in this land um, before it became um, the, the Navy Yard. So this is a great map showing and depicting um, the waterways in the area. And as you can see, there are some meadows, mud flats, um, and um, really sort of interesting topographical um, areas around the NCL. This sort of 
or this small black circle in the bottom right of the screen is the part that we're going to sort of zoom in on, uh, which is where the Naval Hospital was and is today. Um, and here is another um, fun map. This is uh, from around the same time period, the 18, early 1800s. Um, but I chose to include this map because it also shows how agriculturally rich this part of Brooklyn was during this time period that you can see sort of the patchwork um, on the map, all of that, all of those squares, those are fields with crops, orchards, um, and this is a really important part of Brooklyn's history and um, is also an important part of the NCL um, in its design. The anecdotal um, the anecdotal uh, sort of story here is the, the bill of sale for the land that the NCL is on, um, claiming that this had the, um, the best apple orchard in the neighborhood. And in 1824, this parcel of land was sold for $4,000. So back then you could have picked up a really nice prime uh, parcel of Brooklyn real estate for, for $4,000, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Um, and this red dot uh, on the map is just another example just to sort of orient you of where we are. Um, and that kind of brings us up to 1800s, mid 1800s, um, when the Navy Yard um, started to really establish itself and the Naval Hospital um, came to be. So I don't, uh, Doug, would you like to- Sure, I can- uh, a dovetail with you here and please feel free to um to, to chime in so uh the lovely phrase um salt meadow was on one of the previous maps and i think we're looking across that salt meadow right now this is the wallabout bay a very marshy um sort of quicksandy geology uh which makes it makes it very difficult to build on um but what we're do looking right across the wallabout bay around across what would what is now dry docks with ship repair going on uh, you're looking right up at this uh, Naval Hospital building. That's the first main structure that was uh, built on the Schenck family land. Um, it was um, uh, built in 1838 and it's now a, a national landmark. And uh, so that really marks the beginning of this property to be used as a, as a, as a medical facility, uh, a purpose it served up until 1948 for 110 years. Um, other buildings came and we'll see some of those a little bit later on, but uh, um, it's really, it's really the, we're starting here because it's the establishment of the hospital, which gave rise to the cemetery uh, later on. You can see an obvious uh, connection there. And we have information that the burials began in 1834, I think. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah 1834, 1831 is when the cemetery yeah, that's right. was, uh, and, and, and quite, quite possibly even a little bit before that, there may have been some uh, a family use of, of some kind there. Um, right. Th those, 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 uh, those actual origins are a little, little unknown, but uh, you know, tradition, like you would, you would put a cemetery where there is one already and sort of build on a tradition there perhaps. But, uh, but yeah, 1830, 1831, 1834 is when the cemetery started to be um, actively used as an internment space. Um, and it served that purpose just uh, up, up until 19, 1910. So what we're doing here is we're looking up at that same building up to the right hand side of your screen there. You can see that main hospital building, that 1838 building. And you can also see another building hospital related over to the left. You can see, um, well, you'll see quite clearly a clock tower and then between the clock, clock tower and the hospital building, you'll see another structure. That's the chief surgeon's quarters, um, now a city landmark uh, built in 18. 33. It's a very, very grand home and still on the site today. But interestingly, what you're looking at now, for those of you who know the Navy Yard site, this will look quite unfamiliar. You're looking at the Wallabout Market, which is uh, one of the world's largest wholesale food markets up until the Second World War when it was taken down to make room for a, a naval, for the, for the Brooklyn Navy Yard expansion. Um, but uh, I always remark, you know, all of this infrastructure just was, was raised. So it served that purpose for 50, 60 years or so. And these markets that we're looking at are now the Steiner Studio building. Not the Steiner Studio. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and also where some of the, um, some of the, I think also where the the, the, the current current federal ownership of the land at the Navy Yard is with um, the Red Cross parking. For the 
cemetery is on the opposite side of the hospital. From yeah, the yeah, absolutely. Right. So the cemetery, we haven't, we're not even there yet. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's off the edge of this photograph behind the large 1838 building. Yeah. And this next slide, Doug. Um, yeah, just, really just quickly, I mean, because, you know, we're talking about history and, and, and landscape here. And, and to me, uh, these photographs are taken from 1920 from the hospital. And to me, they typify uh, an interesting element of, the, of this particular medical facility, which is recognized as a leading hospital in the country, uh, particularly after the, second, after the First World War, when medical advancements improved, people started to survive injuries and survive surgeries more than they used to, which gave rise to the need for occupational therapy, recovery practices. And that's what you can really see here. And so the Naval Hospital was really a pioneering space for, for that emerging field. Uh, weaving, and then you can see the prosthetics there. Amazing. Yeah. And so this is really the story of some of the people that were in terms Yeah, the story of some of the people. And it's really interesting, you know, the story that we'll get to is, you know, uh, who wound up in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of where we're going. And then, in, and sneak, you know, you know spoiler alert, um, who's still there. You yeah, know. exactly. Um, so this next slide is, a, is the first in a series of three aerial photographs, kind of bringing us up to modern day. Yeah. Um, I tried to spend some time orienting myself with this, Doug, but I couldn't really oh. make out where sure. it ends Well, up. Um, you can see the big sort of Pac-Man shaped building, if you will, uh, which is the 1838. Yeah, that one right there. That's the mm. 1838 building that we've seen from the other side. And then just up to the up and to the left of that, that's the little square chief surgeon's quarters. And these other buildings, you would have trouble orienting yourself because they're not there anymore. They've been taken down. Uh, that was capacity that was put up. Well, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure when it was put up, but it was capacity that was used to its fullest extent during the Second World War, uh, when 65, um, uh, you know, when 65,000 patients would have come through the, the the hospital. Huge, huge use during World War II, and uh, just before it closed in in, in 48. Right. So you don't see it. Um, a lot, most like half of those buildings aren't there anymore. This also shows an inlet. Do you see the water in the upper right corner? Oh, yeah. That I've oh, yeah, there's a slip almost. Yeah. And our site then is the trees that you can just see on the right-hand yeah, margin of the We're photograph. sneaking up on the cemetery, yeah. No, on, the other, on the other side, Danielle, yeah. Right here? Yeah. So we're just off the page. Okay. So this is Flushing Avenue down here. Correct, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, and that hip roof building in the bottom right, I believe that's, that's still standing. That yeah. is still standing. Um, and one of those two buildings was the morgue for a while. Mm. And then Great. just off the photograph was the, uh, an interesting building, which was a film repository where they controlled all the movies that were shipped out to um, uh, Navy ships around the world during World War II for entertainment. And now it's home to the Navy or cats. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this next photo is um, pre-construction. And uh, I think it's important to also talk about the fact that prior to this photo being taken, um, if you could speak to this uh, as well, Doug, mm. bodies were exhumed sure. from- so I, I can sort of give the nutshell um, as, as far as our research has been able to, to determine. So uh, from 1831 to 1910, this served as an active uh, cemetery uh, for the hospital, uh, but you didn't have to be associated with the hospital to be buried there. You could have maybe died on a ship or maybe somewhere else, uh, but uh, it was definitely connected to the hospital primarily. And this was for servicemen as well as maybe their families. There's a couple of children who are documented as being uh, put, uh, put in the ground there and turned and um, uh, also, if I didn't mention, uh, some civilians as well. Um, so all in all, we estimate, uh, and it is an estimation, but it's a fairly good one, around 2,000 graves were created in the cemetery. And then in 1926, um, it was decided to move these graves to Cypress Hills. And um, this is when it gets interesting because um, we have documentation of just under a thousand graves being moved to Cypress Hills, I think 987. Um, so that leaves a big number, about a thousand that we don't know what happened with. So, and then we have of the documented graves, of the documentation that we have of the graves that were created, we know uh, that 517 of those graves were absolutely not transferred. So low conservative figure, there's at least uh, the 517 remains here in the ground. So it's a documentation issue. And so that gives rise to the, the challenge of building on this site that we'll talk to in just a minute. Um, and historically, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to front load the conversation too much because I want to get to the design of the landscape, which is where we're going. But, but the, the, 
the, the, the, the, the graves that are included in the cemetery landscape are interesting for many reasons. One of which, uh, a couple stories, one was there's a, um, there's about 45 of the graves that weren't moved, 45 African-American uh, soldiers uh, or Navy servicemen were in turn there. So it's an interesting part of the African-American experience in terms of serving for the and serving in the military. Um, and some of them are actually, uh, two of them are actually designated as contraband, which means they were uh, escaped slaves serving um, in the US Navy, uh, which is interesting. And there's also a Fijian chief who was buried there. And he sort of typifies the problem here, uh, Chief Vendor uh, was, con was, was convicted of murder and then brought back to the United States and, oh, and, oh, and died on the way and got here and was buried in the ground. Um, then in the 90s, there was uh, an, an interest to repatriate his remains uh, to Fiji. So he was one of the graves that was supposed to have been transferred to Cypress Hills. They go to Cypress Hills they can't find his remains. Uh, so even, even, on, even the graves that we think may have been transferred, maybe not as well. So it just adds to the murkiness of determining who's there and who's not there. And maybe that's enough to get us going. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. also, um, go ahead, Jeffrey. No, just this before image is also helpful to see in that you can see the mostly mulberry trees that basically surround the site and gives it its really important sense of enclosure that we maintained. Um, there was obviously tons of clearing and, and work to do to get the site to a place where where the design could be implemented. But um, that surround um, turns, you know, is, is, is cr it's critical to the immersive kind of restorative experience that, that people have there. And then in the upper half of that area, you can see uh, is really a stand of trees. Those are those are young mulberry trees. Um, which were kind of a remarkable feature and we were inspired by in basically um, proposing the sacred grove of black cherry trees later to be in that same position. And I, I feel like I might speak more at the beginning and, and maybe a little bit less later on. So I just wanna add Jeffrey that, that those mulberry trees um, on the ecology, so to dovetail from the history of the site to sort of the present day ecology of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, it's the presence of mulberry in and around the cracks of this industrial facility, mulberry, black locust, uh, black cherry, um, milkweed, um, all species that you've selected to highlight in the park. Uh, the ecology tour is built around finding those sort of quote unquote in the wild and then coming to the cemetery landscape at the end and seeing how they've been cultivated and crafted and placed and, and you know, in the creation of this, of this beautiful space. So it's, it's, those, it's those species that really um, sort of tie it all together for me. Yeah. Awesome. And really quickly before we move too much from history, I feel like there's sort of a gap um, from when it, we, I think of as 1926 to 2011, um, mm -hmm. or I guess Joe Geismer's study in the 90s. When exactly was this a ball field? because that also was influenced. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't have an exact date. I mean, you can see the, you can see the light post towers. Exactly. Um, yeah. I'm guessing. I, I hear the eighties from people that have like been in the neighborhood since then. And then yeah, that's what we've heard also like in the, in the eighties, maybe into the early nineties, but uh, definitely late seventies, early eighties. Okay. My, my nostalgic brain wants to go fifties and sixties just cause you know, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> ball field culture but you build, uh, it, but, you know, you build it they will come yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing yeah um but uh yeah it was used as a as a ball field and until uh the navy left uh in the early 90s uh when they started to to like uh, transition the property and get it ready for city ownership because the navy it seems as a medical facility in, in in 48 but the navy stayed there and used these buildings for administrative purposes as well as some housing up and through the late 80s right. um and so it's it, they could it could have been used as a wall field for some of the folks living there in the 80s that's you know scott yeah that's very likely um because the, um the field just to the um just well actually you can see it on the photograph um if you see where you've got your red demarcation just to the right of that this, see... this is me drawing by the way in case you're wondering Thank you, oh nice oh good <laughs> um can i do that um the um if you just post. just to the um just to the uh right of that red uh uh um quadrilateral thing <laughs> you'll see uh, a long meadow and at the at the bottom of your screen, you can might be able to make out a little goalpost there, which is a football. Yeah, there we go. Just the, there we go. 
it's a football stand or a football oh. goalpost. So there's sports being played there too. Um, Great. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so, so <laughs> in preparation for transition to city ownership in 1999, 98, there was extensive ex uh, research done into who's in this landscape and who's in the ground still, um, as well as they took out some asbestos from the buildings then too. Uh, but so then it was in 2001 that the city took ownership of the land. And that kind of speeds us up to um, 2016 um, when the design and construction of the space had been completed and open to the public. So um, as Jeffrey mentioned, you can see the perimeter of the NCL still has that really nice thick um, concentration of mulberry trees and there's some other like black cherry trees that are pretty mature some red maples some oaks um, and so it does give you that um, really nice enclosed feeling and I also I always point this out to visitors that um, just adjacent to the BQE that berm um, is pretty wooded as well which creates an even fourth wall um, to sort of drown out the sounds of traffic. You can also think of it like from a real estate perspective with the, the traffic kind of sounding like water and giving you a nice like lulling, um, lulling vibe. Um, so um, how did we get from here to the here? Um, this is when I'd really love Scott to talk about how you and Jeffrey um, incorporated uh, the land's history that Doug just gave us a great overview of um, into a lot of the construction um, of the space and what are some of the challenges that Marvel faced uh, and maybe some of the, the benefits of it being like a cemetery and have so, having so much of this layered history. Right, right. I mean, I mean, there's such a, a, a layered history to bring into this that, that Jeffrey has referred to in some of the some of the landscape elements that are there with the with the plantings and with the the notion of trying to develop this kind of meandering boardwalk that goes around the perimeter of the of the cemetery site and gives you access to some of those special moments. But to execute that in terms of the the boardwalk in terms of architecture was was a real challenge. Uh, yeah, th this photograph is great because this was, you know, an early image uh, of as as the site was found with with a lot of the overgrowth that's there. Um, but it, when you go by the site today and you're going by on the on the greenway or you're walking by on the street, you're pretty much looking at today kind of eye level for where that that boardwalk is actually located. And so the notion of trying to respect the ground that's there because it is sacred ground. There are these burials that remain there that um, we don't know the quantity of, of how many persons are there. We don't know where they're located specifically because there's no good records. So the entirety of the site is, is very special and very sacred. And the approach that we took was to try and elevate that whole boardwalk up so it literally floats on top of uh, the soil that's there. Um, and every that whole boardwalk is up by 18 to, to 30 inches, depending on where you are on the site. But to execute that also, um, it's the concept of having the boardwalk float over the landscape and over the earth, but also to build it and have something that's there that doesn't disturb the earth too substantially. And so what you're seeing in this image is this very simple foundation system that was used to actually support the piers that hold up the boardwalk. Um, what you're seeing on the left are these packaged bundles of these little, you know, concrete, you know, tetrahedrons or something that are, that are there that have these little cores that are gr drilled through them. And each one of those elements is just placed on, onto the earth. There's a little bit of soil that's excavated, about 12 inches or so, and they're placed across the site. And then in the right-hand photo, you see sticking out of them these four uh, stainless steel um, tubes and what happens is those tubes are actually just um, uh, pushed down into the earth and those are what hold each of those concrete um, elements in place. That's the foundation system and then the entire um, boardwalk is actually built up on top of that. So everything is very, very light from a design concept that it's, that's hovering over the earth to the actual execution with these little concrete elements and just these steel pins that penetrate down to the earth to hold those, those concrete elements in place that hold up the boardwalk. 
Um, and of course, the experience of coming to the space as well from the street. Of course, you have to go from the street and walk up. And that's, that's the idea of that threshold that you come through. Right. You go up those steps, you go up the ramps uh, uh, to rise up to that boardwalk level that allows you to walk around the perimeter of the space. And the boardwalk, one of my favorite design elements, um, is made of black locust wood, um, which yes. is great use of um, natural resources, something that's native to the region. But I also realized today, and I guess it's really well executed design that I hadn't noticed it until now, that the way that the boardwalk was, the way that the boards were laid they drive your view into the meadow. So it's not like opposing the plantings. It's sort of like you're following the line of the boardwalk into the meadow, which I thought was pretty genius. So kudos. Yeah, yeah the, the alignment of all those boards actually when you walk through, it's, it's not like um, a, a typical boardwalk you might see at the beach or something like that, where they're always running um, uh, um, perpendicular to the framing that's down below. And as that boardwalk kind of moves around in another instance, um, they're always perpendicular to the path. In this instance, the boards are actually always running one direction. So they don't, they don't change so much when they go around the, uh, the perimeter of the site. They're always going one direction. They're not always perpendicular to your travel path. So that viewpoint is, is changing as you, as you move around. And you're right, you experience it one way when you, when you walk in and you see that directionality of the boards but as you move to different locations around the perimeter, um, it stays consistent. Yeah, as a visitor, I really, really love the proportions and the, um, the you know, the, the subtle elements like that of the boardwalk. They really, really function beautifully. Yeah, and, and all the black locust was, was harvested upstate New York. Um, the contractors that we work with, they actually milled a lot of it themselves. Uh, brought it to the site, laid it down. You can see in the construction here, all those boards kind of extended out beyond the framing that's there. And then the final move was to come back and do that kind of subtle curve that goes all the way around the perimeter of the site and get all those edges in, in alignment with each other. Um, and another amazing design element um, is the stones. Um, and I would love for both you um, Scott and Jeffrey to talk about how they came to the site and why they're there um, as a design element. Yeah, uh, Jeff, yeah, maybe can, you could take that one because you, you kind of sourced those and brought them. Yeah, um, so it, it, it harkens back to kind of an overall idea about this project, which is that the entire landscape is a memorial and is meant to be somewhat abstracted and somewhat open to interpretation for the visitor in, in their own way, that it could be really visitor led. So these this element was was meant in fact to be partly to acknowledge that this is in fact sacred ground this is in fact burial but also originally the concept was that these would be mooring blocks that it was also hearkening to the to the history of the brooklyn navy yard um, and that we had originally expected these concrete blocks with the sort of steel rings and they were used to sort of moor ships while they were here getting repaired or 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 just housed here um, but it was through design dialogue that we decided the granite, the concrete wasn't at a refined enough finish for what we thought this place deserved, that it didn't have the integrity that, that the, um, the granite blocks could. So, you know, for us designing the, the meandering boardwalk, which, which has a kind of curve that was actually inspired by the old maps of Wallabout Creek. So these drainage systems that were helping to drain this part of the the wet meadow into the into the bay and that had these very sinuous qual that had this very sinuous quality. Um, the mooring blocks were meant to kind of disrupt that a little bit, but also to provide a really playful full body experience for people who might decide to kind of hop off the boardwalk and kind of jump from block to block. Um, so it is sort of part memorial, part nod to the Navy Yard history and part invitation for people to not take this so seriously and to bring a sort of liveliness to the site. It's the same reason that we thought to plant it with pollinator plants that drew as many pollinators to the site as possible. Like the ground is sacred and it could have been a really quiet meadow of just grasses, but to bring as many different elements of life to the site in terms of pollinators was one of the ways that we thought that this could be about renewal 
while recognizing that it's uh, a memorial. So in the same way, this photo illustrates it perfectly. It just, it, my heart sings when I see people kind of get there and, and take this sort of full body experience by hopping on these, on these, um, on these granite blocks. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that I really enjoy too, watching like the adults feel like they're invited and they're allowed to sort of like, and they have to jump and kind of be playful. It's a really fun um, experience. They're perfectly spaced. So you yeah, yeah. yeah, well, there was, there was a lot of careful spacing in the, in the <laughs> field. I would say the other thing is that the meandering boardwalk is a bit of a circumference around the meadow where you feel like you're kind of mostly at the margin of it. And that this was to allow individuals to sort of be, get closer to the center. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't, on the drawings, we would never call that a walkway because it would never meet anybody's code. So it's <laughs> really a sculptural item. And if people choose to, to walk on them, that's their, you know, that's their decision. Great. Uh, when I bring adult groups here, as well as children, they say they're, they're really excited to have permission to go out there. Like, really, can I? That's kind yeah. of the response. And it's like, it's, it's you know, because we're so used to having, um, you know, this barriered experience in memorial spaces. Yeah. Can I point out one more small item in that photograph and this one? We talked earlier about the lights that were there for the sport court. And early on in the project, when we were doing the demo plan, originally we talked about demolishing those posts. But we realized like these could be another kind of enigmatic kind of nod, a kind of totem to the history of this site that uh, we pulled all the electrical conduit and lights off of it, of course. So what le what's left are these, these totems that, that again, kind of nod to memorial and burial. Mm -hmm. They also provide um, perch for birds who are taking their view over this um, lunchbox for them. <laughs> the yeah, I have an example of that um, later on in the slideshow as well, okay. some actual documented evidence of them being used. So um, also here's a great before and after shot of the entrance. Um, as Scott mentioned, you know, it, it's a it was a challenge, but also um, a really important element in creating a threshold that invited visitors off of the built greenway and into sort of this unbuilt um, uh, natural escape. And it also perfectly frames the, the meadow. And this is probably the most photographed um, part of the meadow. As soon as you walk in, you would just like your instinct is to take out your phone. So we have a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, part part of the intent of that threshold also is is part of the design is a the the NCL isn't open all the time, so it is is a gate that that opens and closes. But we wanted to make that gate disappear as much as possible uh, when it's actually open. So there's really no notion of of potential for closure there. It's just this threshold that you step through, and mm -hmm. and part of it was to make that appear as as kind of thin as possible from the streetscape. Uh, as you're walking up to it. So the, the, the attendant station that's off on the right hand side, the bench that's off on the left, those walls are like splayed back a little bit. So it's a bit of a perspective play also. So when you're looking from the street, those elements just go away um, and you aren't seeing a lot of architecture that gets in the way uh, other than just the threshold itself. And I'm just excited to notice, you know, to Jeffrey's point, the sort of the standing uh, posts there are really sort of sentinel guards uh, that photograph really sort of brings that out. Yeah. I'm just noticing Here's that. Another great before and after of where the amphitheater is currently. Um, all of these photos kind of illustrate really well. This one in particular, how the symmetry of the, um, or the placement of the, the, the boardwalk um, kind of drives your attention into the meadow. Um, and then uh, here's another example of, as you mentioned, Jeffrey, that mulberry grove in the beginning influencing the sacred grove and a couple other pictures of the space sort of in its raw form. Um, and this is an early rendering dated 2011. So probably some of the first design concepts of, that Nelson Bird Woltz put out of uh, what I hope to spend a little bit of time on briefly, the planting um, and the, the linear qualities of it. Um, this image is the same image, but it actually shows where the plant plugs were placed in order to create um, a linear um, pattern in the meadow. And those are all different species. Um, what, was, what was the reason for creating this sort of pattern planting system, Jeffrey? I mean, that, 
Honestly, that was another, you'll notice this pattern is actually in the same orientation as the boardwalk. So mm -hmm. yeah, yes. it was another, another effort to, well, one, to expand the space. So you're kind of giving this linearity from one mm -hmm. extended corner to the other. Um, but, but also it was another subtle nod to burial. And some of those, some of those uh, blocks of single species plantings are in the proportion of a human body. It was also meant to nod to the agricultural history of the site and also about time that, that people would see this site early days, would recognize these blocks of single species planting and return over the years and see that this is an open-ended ecology and it's naturalizing and everything is really drifting. Right. Um, and we thought that added a layer of dynamic uh, kind of landscape to, to folks who would come here year after year and see something that had a kind of rigor to it that was a little militaristic, that was a little burial, a little agricultural, and that would become more and more and more of a kind of more naturalistic, um, that the, the plants would sort of take on a life of its own here, establish the community that they'll establish based on site conditions and, and all of that. So, and you'll see here the strings, I mean, inst installing these plugs, there were eight, 15 to 18,000 plugs in these, in these beds um, was, a, was a big job, but an yeah. exciting, incredibly exciting moment in the history of the project. Um, and here's a quick glance at some of the species that are planted, showing if they are uh, pollinated by or providing resources to butterflies, birds, bees, um, and are all native plants. Um, and one of my favorite uh, things to show people, I know this isn't a great quality image, but this is a bloom calendar, which shows the bloom periods of all of those different species that were introduced, the native species. So you can see that from mid-April all the way through until um, the late fall, things are in bloom and providing ecological benefits um, to the insects and um, birds that live in this space. And so, not only are these ecological benefits important to those um, creatures, but it also creates like a really beautiful plant palette um, that you know is enjoyed throughout all summer and into the fall and winter because we're a four season meadow. Um, so here's an example of 2017 when the meadow was you know sort of creeping first year leap, or first year sleep, second year creep, third year leap. Right. Um, and so these Joe Pye weed, those little pink poofs in the middle there, those are like at least 10 feet tall um, and will be the season. So it's exciting to kind of pretend to be a little kid in the um, NCL and have them sort of towering over you. Um, oh, sorry, Scott, yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> I was slow with the pen. Uh, I'm trying to get through these slides. Um, and this was actually uh, taken in May of 2019. So already like the landscape is really establishing itself in early spring. Um, that post that's in the back, we've mentioned them. That's the red tail hawk family's favorite. Um, so at dusk in the summertime, you can come by and catch one of the red tails hanging out up there, you know, prowling, seeing what they're gonna have for dinner. Um, and then I just have a couple images that show sort of the um, different uh, vantage points that one can have in the NCL during the time of season, during the time of day. So this was taken August 2019, sort of like midday. And then, you know, a month later in September, you have sort of this totally different dusty palette in the evening. Um, and really, um, last year we saw so many amazing layers kind of come out um, in the meadow with all of the different species. This is the sacred grove. Some of these, like the purple Monarda fistulosa, those are almost as tall as some of the young cherry trees that are planted. Um, and we really saw the cherry trees develop as well, providing a lot of shade in that area. Um, here's those Joe Pye weed eye level looking out into the meadow, but kind of clouding everyone's view. Um, another example of how the plantings sort of can, can transform throughout the day, this is fo these photos were taken on the same day in September last year, um, or excuse me, in July, and to the left was midday and to the right was sort of later in the evening. So the colors in the meadow um, can just, the plants literally change color um, depending on the time of day that you're there. I, I believe that's one of the blocks too that you can actually yeah. read on the, yeah. Mm. Yeah, this is kind of from the amphitheater looking towards the entrance on the right. Um, you can see there's like a block of echinacea. 
And, you know, all of these plants from afar have this beautiful layered textured quality that really are, is soothing to the, to the eye. But then up close, there's so much detail. Like this blue vervain is like one of the most structurally interesting um, things planted in the space. And then throughout the seasons, you have August, you know, from, from looking to your left in the sacred grove and then to the right in October, providing like a really dynamic um, exchange. And the same visitor can come all season long and just sort of experience the same place differently. Um, and even in the winter, you know, I, the runners that brave the snow in January and February just love coming to the NCL because where else in Brooklyn do you get to go to just like pristine snow covered area that also doesn't have trash bags, you know? Um, so it's definitely um, really amazing in the winter and leaving all of the um, stalks from the plants that have you know, the grasses and the forbs um, throughout the season provide a lot of nesting habitat um, for our pollinator and bird friends as well. Um, so the meadow, like you said, Jeffrey, open-ended ecology provides the resources that um, butterflies, insects need um, from, you know, their caterpillar stage all the way up to adulthood and, and beyond. Um, Really quickly, just to touch on some of the public programming that we've had in the space the last five years. Um, the Hort and the Green School um, had a great program going when we first opened that engaged a lot of the youth in the local area, um, helping to steward the space and um, find connection to it. Um, and these connections sort of have lasted throughout the years. Um, City Growers, one of our partner nonprofits, does uh, K through 12 education in this space about uh, urban ecology, and the site can really transform to become an outdoor classroom. Um, they also host Brooklyn Bee Corps every year, and uh, this is actually from the year that I helped lead um, that program, teaching uh, high school students how to become beekeepers and learn skills that will be transferable in the green job sector. Um, and those Brooklyn Bee Corps students also help steward the space by removing invasives and picking up garbage um, and receive a stipend for this work at the end of the season, which is an awesome uh, career opportunity. Um, we've also had some amazing artwork happen. Um, every year, it seems there's um, something interesting going on. This is James Letters, Leonard's installation, The Tent of Casually Occurring Phenology in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, Buried Histories with Sarah Olson, which was um, um, something that, Doug, you were involved in. Um, I worked through the uh, concepts of that a little bit with Sarah, talking about how to use, because what you're looking at there is the shoreline of Wallabout Bay, and those fingers are actually the, the dry docks uh, where oh, cool. here today. That's the, that's the shape that you're... Um, that you're appreciating. Um, and that's obviously a pre-Navy Yard version of the shoreline. Right. And the wall about Creek as well that I think Jeffrey mentioned down to the bottom right there. Um, and then in addition to this space being a sort of art, uh, a gallery, if you will, an outdoor gallery, um, we've also been able to interact with people and provide wellness opportunities for the community um, through weekly yoga sessions um, and sound meditation in the meadow. Um, some uh, of our most popular programming is um, Alex Beckman's um, hour-long sound bath uh, in the NCL. It's pretty incredible. Um, and then uh, one of the design elements and also one of the sort of more unique aspects of the space is the uh, sacred bench. Um, and this is uh, something that's unique to the NCL, but um, is found in all of Nature Sacred's sites because it has a journal um, underneath it and it's part of their ongoing effort in understanding the importance of green space uh, that green space and nature has on city dwellers. Um, so it offers an opportunity for people to come and sort of share their thoughts and feelings um, and find a little bit of respite in the, the city. Um, I can't tell you how many people come in asking about the journal, um, wondering what happens to it, but also just needing it to find a connection to strangers is really powerful. Um, and this is something that it does in other places as well, right? Yeah, yeah. The bench is in all of the uh, nature sacred uh, sites. Um, and so over the past, you know, four or five years, community has really been building and that kind of takes us to present day. This was taken last year, 2019, um, where uh, the team and I really tried to also um, 
develop more of the citizen science connection and understanding that open-ended ecology of the space um, because we feel that this is a really important aspect of the NCO um, and something that will help um, to support the future of other sort of projects like this in the city. Um, so there are the four associates, um, Jeffrey and then Penn from Pennington Gray who um, manages the site from a larger horticultural standpoint. Um, and so we've really taken it on ourselves to sort of document heavily um, the site and record anything that we see that's going on um, through just observation um, and, and, and then implementing any, uh, any of that into our management of the site. Um, we also expanded programming involving um, bird, in, involving the bird population. So here in this image, you can see um, bottom right is Heather Wolf, um, birder and author based in Brooklyn. And on the left, um, this is a great shot through our our binoculars at the site of two kestrels perching on the post, like right by the office. And um, we have, you know, seen kestrels all season, well, all year long for the past two years there. So um, thinking that they nest nearby is, is a possibility, but also that they just like to come and enjoy the buffet of insects. Um, and uh, again, we, this open-ended ecology is really important because um, we're finding more and more animals and creatures making this space their, their forever home. So we have nesting robins um, and, uh, and are, are sort of trying to share that with the larger community. Open House New York last year was a really big success for us because it marked the largest or, or greatest day of visitation that we've had in our history. So um, over twice as many people came to Open House New York in October 2019 than they did to opening day of the NCL in 2016. So we're really starting to become part of this community. Um, this is, these are images from Bird House, which was a choreographed dance by uh, Kaylee Shimizu. Um, and uh, one of my highlights uh, at, at the NCL has been working with uh, entomologist and other and NCL advisory committee member Sarah Kornbluth, um, who helped us really hone in our understanding of the native bee population at the NCL. Um, so we spent an afternoon with her in July of last year learning netting techniques and um, collecting samples of the native bees and wasps in the NCL. Um, she took those samples back to the American Museum of Natural History, where she's based, and sent us um, documentation of over um, I believe 18 different species. Um, and one really interesting finding was a parasitic wasp that is only found in locations where nesting habitats for um, the leafcutter bees, Texas leafcutter bees are superb. So that was a really interesting finding and it's had impacted the way that we move, um, manage this site moving forward. Um, and so part of sharing that information is becoming more involved in the citizen science community uh, internationally through iNaturalist and participating in City Nature Challenge. Anyone that goes on to iNaturalist can now look for the NCL and see everything, every species that's observed in that space. Um, so a great diversity of bees, um, other insects, um, large and small. And uh, this kind of led us to uh, seeking out recognition for the ecology and uh, specifically for the resources that we're providing to monarch butterflies. Um, here you can see the monarch in all of its life stages at the NCL and that uh, took us to receiving the recognition of monarch way station last year. So um, we're recognized as providing enough nectar rich and um, nectar rich annuals and uh, perennials and milkweed for monarchs to lay their eggs on. And here's a really quick um, fun uh, piece of history about milkweed. Um, it's Doug provided these images for us. These are the milkweed pods and um, inside the pods have, uh, there's this silky uh, floss that the seeds are connected to, which helps the milkweed spread its um, seeds. Um, but in World War II, milkweed pods were collected and um, could be used for stuffing the life jackets of um, the Navy officers. Did I get that right, Doug? That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, the, the wind dispersal mechanism. Yeah, so you would, you would stuff uh, bags of this. It was something that school children were encouraged to do and they would uh, 
stuff these onion sacks full of milkweed pods in the fall and would get 15 cents a bag in the, uh, for, their, for their efforts. And you can see the little guy on the right-hand side actually wearing a life preserver there. And that was because the Kapok plant that had originally been used in, to serve as the flotation medium uh, was inaccessible because of the war going on. So we needed to find a domestic uh, substitute. So the, the, the monarch butterfly food became, you know, the, the life preserver stuffing. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, we were talking earlier about how Victory Gardens back then probably also mm -hmm. could include a nice little milkweed patch. We should bring that back. Mm -hmm. um, and last but not least, uh, we received recognition internationally um, from Archetizer um, and were the recipients of their jury, um, or excuse me, uh, we're a jury winner of the A plus awards in the landscape and planning public park category. Um, and that was sort of a, a really great recognition, you know, as staff members, but also, um, I don't know, Jeffrey or Scott, if you want to speak on, on sort of receiving recognition for the design of the space as well. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's external validation is nice, but I think it also, it broadens kind of the profile of the project. And I think this kind of project is really a model. It's very unique. Uh, as an urban project. And I, I think that's probably the, the greatest benefit is that outside of even New York City, that it more eyes are on it, designers eyes and potential clients and, and cities who are thinking, who have to sort of rethink what public space means um, when we're thinking about ecology and maybe now while we're thinking about, <laughs> about distance and providing opportunities for more reflective sort of single, you know, one, one person uh, restorative experience. So I don't know, for me, that's kind of a big upshot of these kinds of um, recognitions. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really kind of helped, um, uh, not the recognition specifically, although it helps to validate it, but it, it's the success of the Naval Cemetery has kind of developed how we as the, as the board and, and running, running uh, uh, BGI have thought about what public space is really about because the, the Naval Cemetery is so unique. It's distinct from a waterfront park. It's distinct from other New York City park spaces that you go to that are specifically programmed with racquetball courts and basketball courts and things like this that have a certain kind of paving program that's there is how you move through them. Um, it's a different way of approaching uh, landscape and public space overall. Uh, and so it's been a very good uh, model for us to, as a first one for an experiment, uh, and we're hoping to be able to develop other parallel ideas in other places in Brooklyn as well. If I could yeah. just jump in. Um, it, it, to me, I just uh, hats off to the designing, uh, to, to designing to the team of designers here. Uh, I know we're wrapping up on time, but I wanted to just stitch in here that um, uh, to me, the, the, the living landscape as memorial of life past is, a, is a, I think, a, a wholly unique uh, um, element of a memorial space. I don't know that I've seen that elsewhere, and I think that's why this is so, so, such a remarkable achievement. And also, as Scott was just saying, the, the, the creation of um, the, the, the acknowledgement of ecology and reflection as activities that are worthy of elevating, of being elevated to, uh, to, uh, to the status that they might need to be in order to be the focal point of an urban park, uh, even in a small, relatively small area like this, I think is, uh, is really quite, quite stunning. Yeah, um, I, I definitely feel like having been involved in this um, as a steward and um, just ob observing the space not only has it made me feel more connected to nature, but it also has been really opportunistic in engaging with the other sort of waterfront green space communities and leaders. And I think that that sort of cohesion and communication is going to be creating resiliency um, for all these green spaces uh, along the, the along the waterfront and in Brooklyn, which is beneficial to you know the birds and bees, but also to us humans um, because this green space is really vital in um, in our experience of the city. And I just really quickly, I know we're wrapping up on time, but um, I wanted to touch on what we where we are right now. Um, you know, as uh, during a pandemic, the NCL's importance as a, a space for solace and connection with nature is really heightened. Um, we've tried to, and uh, I think successfully 
converted a lot of our programming over to vi virtual experiences. So um, this is 2019's Jane's Walk with Jeffrey giving a, a tour of the NCL. Um, and then this year, we were able to work with and partner with Turnstile Tours to create a virtual tour of the space that allows people to still connect and observe and learn from the space, but um, from the safety and comfort of their own home. And so we'll be experimenting with more virtual programming like this um, throughout the season. Um, but we also have opened the space back up and um, with a very, very um, strong emphasis on staff and visitor safety but also recognizing that this is a place that people have a connection to, like a really deep connection to, and not being able to access it could, um, could do harm or it could you know, maybe prevent harm from being done if you're, you're able to sort of come and experience nature. So we're happy to be able to welcome people into the space again um, safely and, uh, and with everyone's uh, safety in mind. So there's Greg. Um, yesterday, opening day, welcoming people back in. We're all really excited to be back in the space too. So it's been it's been great. Um, and so some kind of like superficial but really important updates. Um, we're currently working with local Navy Yard um, ma manufacturer, fabricator Bednark Studios to develop a, or actually install the and fabricate the sign, um, a, a newly developed NCL sign um, with recognition of our Monarch Way Station achievements, um, with more information about our public programming from the visitors, um, for the visitors. Um, and they're gonna be doing a really beautiful job of installing that sign in the next month. Um, so we'll be excited to unveil that and just provide a little bit more brand awareness for BGI and the work that they're, the really important work that they're doing. And then last but not least, we have worked on um, throughout the past couple of months, a self-guided tour. This is a rough rendering of what is going to be a pamphlet that people can take with them, more like a map um, through the site, kind of highlighting all of that information that we just talked about in this uh, in the last hour the history the design the ecology um, and kind of give people sort of a keepsake that they can take with them from the space um, and uh, remember the ncl as an important um, you know landmark and point of interest in brooklyn um, so you know we're really excited about this season ahead we obviously had a lot of things planned differently but have been um really appreciative of, of everyone sort of pivoting with us and allowing us to still be in the space and share it with others and you know moving forward into 2020 and beyond um we really hope that the that the ncl continues to be this like amazing place for visitors to come and um, commune with nature in the city so I know we've gone over time a little bit, um, but I'd like to let anyone, um, anyone who had any questions, um, uh, you know, have the, have the floor. Jeffrey, Doug, Scott, if you have any last remarks you'd like to share. Just that uh, for me, maybe a little bit of a context within the Navy Yard, I feel that the landscape is, is sort of a cousin to the Brooklyn Grange Farm which is sort of a, if you're a monarch butterfly, that would be the next stop for you. And so there's really a sort of a philosophical connection between those two, two spaces, as well as uh, I feel we should mention, um, you know, the Billion Oyster Project, which is, which is happening within the, within the Navy Yard, sort of also kind of a stormwater, water quality uh, um, initiative in that way as well. So I really love how the Navy Yard is manifesting these ecological elements in an industrial context, sort of evolving our concept of what progress means. And instead of wiping away nature, we're figuring out how to, how to integrate it uh, with intelligence. Um, so it's, it's part, of, it's sort of connected in this uh, ecology triangle there in the, in the Navy Yard space as well. Uh, I just wanted to thank Danielle and the stewards of the site because it is an open-ended ecology, but it requires uh, disciplined uh, stewardship to keep it healthy. And uh, Danielle and her colleagues have have really done a great job creating uh, this diverse, you know, urban habitat uh, and giving it a future. You know that you know just after construction, it was sort of bombarded with mugwort and. <laughs> this is a, an invasive plant that uh, wants to take over again, and uh, they're not going to let it. And I also am just so excited that it's open. I'm a neighbor, so as a visitor, uh, you know, I have a 16-month-old toddler, and we go on a walk every day, and I can't wait to go back to the, to the Naval Cemetery landscape, which is a place my downstairs 11-year-old 
uh, my neighbor downstairs, he calls it the peace place. Uh, he doesn't know much about it, except he likes to go all the time and refers to it as the peace place. Um, so anyway, just excited to go back. No, it's great. I mean, the the main landscape and the stewardship that's that's of course ongoing. But I think what's what's fantastic about this space is all the opportunities that it offers for interaction, for programming, uh, whether it's individual private walkthrough and reflection, or some of the other opportunities that that BGI is exploring for for use in the space to kind of bring it to the to the forefront uh, of people who might not normally be coming to the landscape, some of the art programs, uh, the choreography, other things that are happening. So all those are are great opportunities to to take advantage of this space and get it out there to another level of, of persons who might not normally experience it. So I'm, I'm really excited about that uh, happening over time. And of course that it's it's back open for, for 2020. Yeah, it's been it's been um, you know remarkable seeing the increased usage of the Greenway, and I, I'm really excited to see how that um, you know drives traffic to the NCL. Like obviously there are people that bike by, and there's no way for them to sort of like whoop, like bike through or up to the NCL. You kind of have to make the decision to stop. Um, but I would say that 50 it's split 50 50 like people that come to this space not knowing happening upon it and being really pleasantly surprised and then people that make it part of their commute or route because it's it's become like part of their routine um, and something that they really derive a lot of um, like pleasure from so uh, you know we we get people coming from Manhattan to which is full of like small green spaces, but we get people that just really like this one. And I think that that all of the design and the construction and the interpretation of the history sort of have provided that perfect opportunity for people to really like continue to grow and understand with the space. So it's been a pleasure um, to, to be a steward and just be in the space. And I want to thank everyone that's in, been involved in, in understanding it and um, making it possible. Um, and I also want to thank everyone who attended um, the uh, panel today and in celebration of the NCL's fifth open season to the public. Um, please stay up to date with all of the happenings at the NCL by um, signing up for the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative's newsletter and or just coming by the NCL. Um, we're currently open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 to 6. Um, until further notice, you can also follow uh, Brooklyn Greenway um, on Instagram or Brooklyn Greenway Initiative is at BK Greenway on Instagram and the NCL is Naval Cemetery Landscape on Instagram where we'll be posting updates um, uh, about the space and uh, its opening um, in the next couple of weeks. So thank you all so much for being a part of this panel. Um, it was a pleasure and I learned, I learned so much and I'm excited to share that with visitors and um, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy in the coming weeks um, and get some time at the NCLN. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you everybody Thanks for leading us. Yeah, of course. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and we'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye.